excited to welcome you to InterVarsity Pioneer Camp Ontario. I don't know if you're a camper or not, but I am, and I want to show you a glimpse into my life. So come with me. Let's go. Yeah, so as a young girl, um, I always wanted to make sure that everyone felt like they had a friend. And so in elementary school, there was this girl that was always by herself in a walker uh, at recess. And so I went over to her and I became her friend. And it was my friend Callie with cerebral palsy. And so I always made sure that she didn't feel alone. I loved hanging out with friends, but I'm also a very active person, and so I love to run outside in nature. I love swimming, and um, I also like kayaking and canoeing and mountain biking and just hiking outside in the outdoors. Yeah, so I went to another camp and they didn't have a special needs program and that was really hard for me because my heart was to have a place where everyone can come and enjoy camp. And so um, when I came to this camp, to Pioneer Camp, and they did have a special needs program, I was so excited that my friend Callie and other friends with special needs could come and enjoy camp. As my final year of university was coming to a close, I was asking God, okay, what do you have next for me? Um, and I was looking through an email and I saw that Pioneer Camp um, Ontario was looking for a special needs director. And I was like, oh wow, like this could really combine both my heart to work with people with different disabilities and um, be outside in nature. And so I looked at the requirements and I was like, yep, okay, this looks like me. Um, but I was hesitant because I was still so young. Um, but I knew that, you know, if God was calling me into this role this summer, that he would fulfill uh, this dream of mine and help me uh, succeed in this role. And so here I am today as the Director of Special Needs at Pioneer Camp Ontario. So through the year, I do not live at camp, I live remotely, and any time a new camper with special needs applies to camp, I contact their parents and I set up an interview time to meet with them. And then I travel to their house and I meet with both the parents and the child and their siblings. And I just ask them some questions about who they are and what they like to do and how we can make their time at camp a successful one. So once they arrive at camp, I welcome them and when they arrive and then I show them where their cabin is, where they'll be living and I introduce them to their leader and then um, we go around camp and we do fun things with them. So um, we go swimming, uh, sometimes if they're in a support staff role, they'll help us organize the tuck shop, sort out the mail, um, we'll all enjoy meals at the dining hall every day, um, Bible studies, lots of things like that. Camp is a great place to connect with God because I'm able to just be outside in nature and see his beautiful creation um, and listen to the birds that he's made. Um, now that I'm in this role, it's really great to know that God cares about every single detail of our lives, even those little dreams that we thought about long ago. And so now it's pretty remarkable to be here at camp and living the dream that I had long ago as a young child. I'm so thankful to God that um, Callie can come and join me now at camp. Um, as you know, as a young girl reaching out to her in elementary school, I never would have thought that today we'd be together here at camp. Well, that was a glimpse into my life at camp. I hope to see you at camp too. See you soon. Hi everyone, welcome. I wanted to take a minute just before we, we dive into musical worship and just time to praise God together, to just take a moment to have a breath, to 
I recognize that a lot of us come from hustle and bustle of, of the day, of the weekend, of this past week, and it's easy to just like come and be in a rush and get through the morning and, and check it off our list, but to actually center ourselves around God this morning, to actually orient ourselves and recognize that God is here and the Spirit is present and He's working and He has something to offer you this morning. And so I just wanted to take a breath. So let's just take a breath in and, and inhale peace and calm and, and joy and inhale. And exhale the busy and the heaviness and the negativity that we might be carrying. Let's just do that one more time. One big breath. And exhale. And now we can stand before God and offer him praise and worship together in community, which is such a beautiful thing these days.
free to stand again if that's how you prefer to worship. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true.
truth. That is all that defines us. Well, hello, friends. Hello, hello. Good to be together today. My name is Mark. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. Um, it is so good to be together today. Boy, I love starting our time with musical worship like that. I find it just sets uh, the stage. It just um, it sorts things out, and it uh, puts us on that path to experiencing and to knowing, to learning about Jesus, um, to hearing about him and welcoming, welcoming him into our hearts. And I hope it has done that for you today, because that is why we're here. We're here to worship Jesus. We're here to learn about him. We're, we're here ultimately to become more like him, right? That is the purpose here. And hopefully learn some things along the way in a way that allows us to show who he is to other people, to people in our lives, to people that we find in our circles and our spheres of influence, those that we interact with. And so I hope that this morning, I hope that our time together can be encouraging and that it has started that way already. Well, if you have been around here for a little bit, you would know that we are currently in our month of prayer. And this is the month as we lead up to Easter, and we're calling it the Road to Hope. Hope being kind of that Easter Sunday time together. And I hope that you're planning to be there with us this year. Easter is, well, Good Friday is April 15th, Easter April 17th. And we're going to be right here as we normally are on a, on a um, morning here in Ontario anyways, and whatever time zone it is from wherever you are participating in. But we'll be here April 15th, 10 a.m., um, 10 a.m. Eastern for Good Friday, and then, of course, Easter Sunday as well. And I hope that you can join us. I know that is going to be a special time, a special um, morning together as we work towards this road to hope. And there are many stops along that road to hope, places that we pause and reflect, pause and consider. Um, we have been doing that all the way, all the way along. And this morning, we are talking about reflecting and I think that is appropriate as we reflect on some of these different things. And Quincy's going to be with us this morning um, later on teaching <clears throat> with us. But before we get there, um, there is one other thing we want to talk about. If you are a part of the Meeting House and would receive our emails, you would know that our senior pastor, Daryl Winger, is transitioning into a, a phased retirement type of um, stage of life. And Daryl has meant a lot to us here at the Meeting House. And so I'm glad that we had an opportunity to sit down with Daryl for one last episode of Winging It with Winger this past week. So will you join me as we um, sit down and take part in that conversation? Hello and welcome to our final episode of Winging It with Winger. Um, this is Daryl. I'm Mark. Daryl, good to be together. Hey, Mark. It, it really is. Thanks yes. for having me on this last time. Yes. I appreciate it. Yes. Our mini-series here that we've kind of created, it's uh, bittersweet, if you will. Mm. So, Daryl, um, we've heard the news that you are stepping into a phased retirement approach towards senior leadership or something like that. That's right. Um, could you explain that for us a little bit? Unpack sure. that. What does that mean? Well, as I said in my announcement video with Maggie, and maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't, is that I really sense that as we begin to move into a new chapter in the life of the Meeting House, yeah. an important one, a significant one, that now is a time to be a cheerleader for newer, younger leadership mm -hmm. uh, to step forward with the strength and vision to move us into the future. And I sense that uh, God is saying to me, leading me into a chapter of life of, of phased retirement. Mm -hmm. um, not that I will be playing shuffleboard or spending time on the beach, but That's certainly today. not um, moving into another senior leadership role, um, being supportive of the meeting house, supportive of the new team, uh, but looking for other ways uh, to uh, serve Jesus and impact the kingdom. Hmm. That's amazing. So as you, as you step into that season then, as you think about the Meeting House here specifically, but also mm -hmm. the broader church in general, mm -hmm. what things are you excited about? What mm -hmm. things give you hope for the future as you kind of step into a new season? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, such an important question. I, I'm excited about the fact, and I've referenced this, mm. that God is raising up newer leaders. Yeah. Uh, God is raising up and has raised up at the Meeting House, mm -hmm. I believe, a strong team. We have gifted women and men serving in pastoral ministry and other roles of the church that um, need to be given an increased opportunity to equip the church and move mm -hmm. the church forward. So I see that both at the Meeting House 
and really in a broad level across the church, I'm excited about the emerging generation of leaders mm -hmm. that God is raising up. Young people, young men and women who are passionately pursuing Jesus mm. that want to move us forward into a new aspect of what the church should be in the, in the future. Mm. Uh, so I'm excited about that. For the Meeting House, I'm also excited about a renewed call to make a difference in our communities, in our neighborhoods, mm. to be, we're using the phrase, parish-minded, to, uh, to care about our communities, to make yeah. a difference in our communities, uh, uh, to be a part of what God wants to do, what God is doing, mm. and partner with Him by His Spirit. Um, not just to sort of grow the church and build the church. That's not what it's all about. It's to make a difference, a loving, yeah. holistic difference in our communities and the lives of people that are experiencing real challenges as we obviously all experience. Hmm. I'm excited about that. Um, I'm excited about um, just being innovative and creative, knowing that yes, in this painful season, we're learning things, but he is wanting to continue to use us that's how he works in our lives. Mm -hmm. He works through the, the painful experiences and the joyful experiences, and he builds us into more and more reflecting the reality of Jesus, mm -hmm. and he does that collectively. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that excite me, and I see that in the Meeting House, I believe that for the Meeting House, and I see that in the global church. Yeah. There's a lot that God is doing these days if we will just perceive that and see yeah. that. Isn't that amazing? That's so beautiful. Okay, then I, I need to ask because I think with your wealth of knowledge and experience, you've been in ministry leadership for over 35 years. Daryl, that is incredible. That is a testament in and of itself. And um, yeah, that really, it can't be said a lot these days. And that means a lot, I think. And so I've got to ask, what, as you think about your past experience, what lessons stand out to you? What things jump out that um, you've kind of leaned on over and over again in your leadership experience? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Mark. Well, you know, I could think of a lot of things, but I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, I, I really think I've learned that the role of listening is increasingly and incredibly important. Mm. If we would just listen to each other. Mm. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a pastor and as a leader, I want to encourage younger leaders and encourage myself and all of us, can we lean into the listening, uh, into conversation, into dialogue? Mm. I think that's so important. Sometimes leadership is described as, you know, saying something and moving us forward. Yeah. And while those things are important, if it's not really um, grounded in listening, a listening posture, I think that's a real miss. Mm. So I'm trying to reflect on that more. Mm -hmm. I think the value of relationship, mm. that we truly lean into being a community together, a, a, a being in relationship with each other. Yeah. And uh, we use the phrase, moving at the speed of relationship. Yeah. Uh, that can be frustrating at times, but I think that's critically important. Mm. And so those are some of the things as I reflect back, lessons I've learned that, uh, that, I, that come to mind right now. Mm. Well, Daryl, um, in the five years that we've worked together, you have demonstrated those lessons over and over and over again to me. So I'm thankful for that experience and for um, the fact that we've been able to work together. You are someone that has always believed in me as a leader, and um, I have felt that. I have felt your support and have learned so many things from you. Mm -hmm. So I personally just wanna say thank you. Um, you will be missed here. And I'm looking forward to many more conversations, maybe not on the shuffleboard, but hopefully, maybe we can get uh, season two, Dine and Dash with Daryl going. There what you, do you go. Think? <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Mark. be a pleasure. Okay, take care, good to be together. I do think that, uh, Doing a dine and dash with Daryl would add a certain spicy element uh, to those uh, to those little segments. Anyways, as I mentioned, Daryl will be missed around here so much, and I'm thankful that he's sticking around. He's providing his wisdom, going to continue to provide wisdom and um, just that experience that is needed here in this space. Um, Daryl is somebody who, when I when I think of the impact that he has. In his leadership, I think of his steadiness, his faithfulness, and his humility. And so, Daryl, we are so thankful, um, not just from me, but from so many others here on staff and as a part of our community for the impact that you have had here in our lives personally, as well as in our community. That cannot be said enough. Okay, at this point, I want to transition to... Um, to giving. This is something that we do here at the Meeting House. It's a part of our regular rhythm. It's a part of who we are, both as, as Christ followers and as Meeting Housers. We want to live, and we feel called to live, 
generous lives. Now that generosity looks like many different things. It looks like giving of our time. It looks like giving of our abilities. And it looks like giving of our resources, uh, things that God has given us. And so if you want to partner with what God is doing here at the Meeting House during this new season, during this um, time as we move forward and look forward to what God has um, for us and with us, you can go to the Meeting House dot com slash give. You can see it on your screen there for more information in how to partner in that way. Okay, I'm going to pray and then we will kick it off to the teaching. <laughs> Please, will you pray with me? Jesus, we just come to you today as we are. We come to you wherever we are and we are thankful that your Holy Spirit is with us. We know that you are um, active in our lives, that you are all around us and that you are leading us uh, to you, that you are shaping us to become more like Jesus. We just pray that our hearts and our spirits would be open to you, to what you have to say to us, to what we're, to where you are leading us. I'm so thankful, Lord, for the generosity of this community and the ways that manifests itself, the so many different ways. Lord, we are in awe of what you are doing here um, in the meeting house and through the meeting house. Yeah, we just lift up the rest of this time to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Every human life is a reflection of divinity, and every act of injustice mars and defaces the image of God in man. Martin Luther King Jr. You are the Father. Mari Povich. Even when light fades and darkness falls, as it does every single day in every single life, God does not turn the world over to some other death. Here is the testimony of faith. Darkness is not dark to God. The night is as bright as the day. Barbara Brown Taylor. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. O God, let me know myself. Let me know you. St. Augustine. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Jesus. Good morning. So good to see you. Really, really good to see you. I'm just happy that we're actually in the same building and there's living people in the mix. Um, my name is Quincy, and um, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's a gift to be able to be with you on this, this journey, this road to hope. Um, it's been a gift that will culminate in a couple weeks when we get to Easter, and uh, I'm looking forward to being able to share more of on how we even got on this road to hope, uh, just the way that God has kind of led us in our community from before uh, we knew all of the things that we know now, that we had this plan to, uh, 
to spend each week focusing on a specific theme. And uh, I've so appreciated the way that we've been able to do that, not just with uh, the teaching and with our uh, experience in home church, but also with um, the resources that have come with this month of prayer in the Road to Hope, and each week focusing on a different theme, a different word. And that's with uh, Monday Zoom call meetings of just focused on prayer, and also the, uh, the resource book of just walking through deliberately week by week. We started with uh, lament, and then it was uh, meditation, forgiveness, agreement last week with Carmen, and today we'll be looking at reflection. So there's two main definitions of this word reflection. One is like how you would look into a mirror and see your reflection. Uh, another uh, definition would be deep contemplation. How uh, I may, uh, when something happens, I'll just sit and pause and before I say something really ridiculous that I'll regret later, I'll reflect on what I might say to not cause embarrassment. And we're going to touch on both of these briefly today, so it's kind of a two for one for you this morning. Uh, you're welcome. Um, but I'll try and, try and keep it in half the time uh, so we're not here all day. Um, if you want you to just pull up your Bibles, if you've got them there, uh, pull them up, pull them out, and uh, just go to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1. And it's the opening of the scriptures, and we get the story of all things beginning. In verse uh, 26 to 31, we get to hear this story being told by God. It's beautiful. It's filled with poetry and with symmetry. And as God speaks, God creates. Let there be day, night, sky, sea, land, sun, moon, stars, fish, birds, and all of the living creatures. Let there be day and night and sky and sea and land. And then he switches and God creates us. And the phrasing moves from God saying, let there be to let us make. Let us make man in our image. Male and female, he created them. And there's something unique about this part of creation. And I think it's more than just our complexity as beings, but it really speaks to our significance. Now, a lot has been said about this uh, little phrase in the opening chapter of Genesis that we are made in the image of God. A lot has been written. I've read a number of books and listened to sermons and read articles, and for everything that I've read, there's hundreds more that I haven't. A lot has been said on this topic. So I want to uh, spend the time this morning looking at a few examples of what this means, this, this packed phrase to be made in the image of God. I want to look at three uh, specific examples and then spend a good amount of time on the fourth. And the first one is, is, is one that I'm most familiar with, and that to be made in the image of God speaks to our ability or our capacity to think or to reason or to create. We are uh, very unique in that sense that we're able to, uh, to have an idea and then bring it into, into uh, reality. When we think of poetry and literature, music and art, we think of uh, architecture, uh, the ability to create systems that organize people. We're very unique and our, our abilities can uh, distinguish us as being made in the image of God. God created and, and so can we. The second would be directly connected to our purpose. Why is it that we're here? To be made in the image of God is to accept the mandate of humankind that we find in verse 28. That is to fill the earth and subdue it. But a more accurate translation would be for us to actually serve the land and protect it. 
I know there's a lot that we can be learning from our indigenous brothers and sisters on what creation care looks like. They do it really, really well, and we've got a lot to learn from our brothers and sisters there. But to be made in the image of God is to care well for all created things. This gives us purpose, gives us reason. And the third is our invitation to community. I mentioned the language changes uh, when God is creating. He says, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. And then he switches it to, now let us make. And most scholars, most theologians uh, would say that the us is not uh, God at his workshop making things and creating and building and all of the angels looking over his shoulder while he creates, saying, oh, like, we're doing a great job. Hey, boss. Like, it's not like that. But the us is, is, a, is a, a glimpse into the Father and Son and Holy Spirit that have always been. And it's this, this idea of community and family from the very, very beginning before anything is created, there is a family. The blueprint is being set to let everyone know that to be made in the image of God is to be in relationship with others. To be made in the image of God is to be in community. And all of these things are very true. Our abilities, or our, our, our abilities, what we can do. Our purpose, why we're here. Our invitation to community. But at the very core of who we are. Because even if we lack capacity to reason or to think, we know that there are people at the very beginning of life who, who can't create anything or can't reason. And we, we know of people who are near the end of their life that don't have that capacity. They, they lose the, the, the ability to be able to, to care for themselves in that way or, or, or reason in that way. Or people with significant uh, mental or physical um, disabilities don't have that capacity. So does that mean that they no longer bear the image of God? or those that don't participate in the caretaking of our creation. Maybe they actually participate in the destroying of our creation. Or, or maybe uh, it's people who are in no position at all to care for anything, but they themselves are being subdued, uh, being crushed by others. Their purpose is, is moved or uh, marred, but does that mean that they no longer bear the image of God? or those that uh, reject being in community or have been rejected by their community. There's still something. And I, and I truly believe that if we get this one right in how we see ourselves as being image bearers of God and that we see others, I think that this can change everything about how we live and move and have our being. Because to be made in the image of God is to hold intrinsic value and worth that goes far beyond anything that we can do, anything that we have to offer, anything that we can do, anything that we can say. But the fact that we are human, regardless of any of those things, means that we carry the mark of the divine. The word image in the Hebrew is selim and would be associated with the idols that were made to honor kings and queens and those that are in power. It would be uh, usually in the form of idols or in statues. And it was typical that the most powerful people would claim that they were made in the image of God. So they would make images of themselves to remind everybody how, how special they were, but also to remind you how special everybody else wasn't. And when the Hebrew people partnering with God set to write the scriptures, starting with, uh, with Genesis, this little small group of obscure and oppressed people who had spent time in slavery and in captivity, when they get to tell the story of creation, they start with this crazy, bold assertion that all people are made in the image of God. 
not just their people, not just powerful people, not just able-bodied people, not just the people that are doing what they're supposed to do, but from the very beginning, in Genesis 1, all people. And this is the first time in this account in ancient history that all people could claim that they, were, uh, that they carried some sort of the divine DNA. It had nothing to do with birthright or status or gender or socioeconomic standing. But to be human, to simply be alive, means that we are the earthly representation of God, full of worth and very valuable. We have his mark. So I want to show you um, a picture of my son, me and my son. I don't know if you can see that. So I'm, I'm the good-looking one on the right. But we're about the same age when these pictures were taken, about nine, ten years old. There's um, any chance of me wanting to get a paternity test? It's, uh, it's out the window. He's, um, we'll call it, that's my, that's my dead stamp. Uh, there's nothing that my son had to do to look that way. He just got out of bed. I think in that picture was taken, he probably just rolled out of bed, actually. But... There's nothing that he had to do to look like that. He just woke up, rolled out of bed, and there he is. The fact that he was born uh, puts my stamp on him. People know that that's my son. It's, it's weird. It's almost like looking into a time machine when I see him. So I, I look at him, and I see, my, I see the past, and he looks to me, and poor kid, he sees the future, <laughs> like what he's got. But there are, there are people that are here today that I think really need to hear what I'm saying in that there is no effort required in you to be considered an image bearer of God. You bear the stamp of the divine. You carry the glory of God. But for so many of us, uh, we have such a, a warped image of God, or sorry, a warped image of ourselves because of the things that we've done or the things that we've said or maybe even what people have said about us or to us. And we've believed the lie that this, this truth can't apply to us, that you're made in the image of God and you currently hold that image and that every time that you look at yourself in the mirror, it should be a reminder of who you are at your core and whose you are. Some of us really need to hear that today. And some of us, some of the same people, um, we can get an inflated um, view of ourselves if we're not too careful. That we, some of us have, have a very positive view of ourselves, maybe too positive of a view of ourselves. And for those of us that are thinking that way, that, well, yeah, of course, I'm a, I'm a child of God. The challenge for you may be something a little bit different, and that is that it's not just you, but it's your neighbor. It's the person on the street. It's whatever people group that you may consider those people. You know those people, right? They carry the mark as well. Because we often don't treat each other uh, like that's true. James uh, chapter 3, verse 9 says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. God's saying, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't praise me and curse your brother or your sister and think that there's a disconnect. Think that there isn't a disconnect. There is a disconnect. And I love this quote by, by Dr. King. He says, every human life is a reflection of divinity. And every act of injustice mars and defaces the image of God and man. Every act mars the image, but it cannot destroy the image. Something that's helped me with how I view people, um, and 
how I've, how I've seen them and how I see them, uh, even some of the most difficult folks that are in my life, was the work that I did in reintegration. Uh, so some of you will know, um, before I came uh, on staff at the Meeting House, I was working in detention centers for youth. And uh, I had a really, really cool, my job is still cool, but I had a, I had a cool job then too. Uh, my job basically was to do a re reintegration work. So basically I would go into a detention facility, um, pick two or three young men that I would meet with for that day, pull their file out, open up my case file, and then take their file and then start populating my case file with all of their information, all their vitals, right? Where they live, how old they are, how many credits they have. And then I get to the part where it has all of their current charges, the reason that they're in detention. And then there'd be another section, sometimes a very large and robust section of all of the things that they'd done previous, all of the charges. And then I would get into a room and the two of us would sit down and we'd have a conversation and we'd put a plan together. So the idea was that uh, while they were in custody, we would figure out a way to allow them to uh, make sure that they never come back. So we put a plan together and that plan would get, and then get brought between uh, parents and teachers and probation officers and whatever, uh, whatever other uh, supports that they would have when they were released. And um, a good friend of mine who was already in the field who loves me dearly, and because he loves me, he knows me, and because he knows me, he can speak uh, hard things to me. You know people that can speak a hard thing, but then they do it in a way that's not really hard? So my friend, he knows that I uh, can suffer from judgmentalism, and uh, I suffer from impatience, and uh, I have a level of immaturity. So his advice was, Quincy, before you go in and meet any of these young people, or before you read their file, sit down and have a conversation with them first. Uh, okay. And after you've met with them, take your notes if you need to, and then meet with them again before you open their, their file. Okay. That sounds really inconvenient um, because that takes a lot of time to do that. But I listened to him because he's, you know, a little older than me and maybe wise, I don't know. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But I said, okay, I'll do that. And I, I understood quickly on why he gave me that advice. And, and what happened was I'd, I'd go and I'd sit down and I would listen. I would listen to stories and I would get to know an individual on a real authentic kind of way and ask questions. And there were moments where I'd start to see that, that divine spark, that image of God within that person. So my friend, he knew that um, if I were to read a file first, my biases would kick in, and I would be able, only be able to see this young person based on the worst thing that they've ever done in their life. And this made things difficult in some ways. But in other ways, it helped me to see people as more than the worst things that they've ever done, but to be introduced to their humanity. And then sometimes able to clearly see the divine spark that lives within them. So this didn't affect them having to deal with the consequences. So in those moments of realizing like, oh, no, you're my brother or you're my nephew, you're still wrong for what you did. You gotta pay, the, pay for the consequences. We're family, but I'll come check for you while you're in jail, but we still have to, we still have to pay for the, the consequences. But this approach has started to spill out into everyday life because while I looked and listened and engaged, God began to prompt me to start looking for that resemblance, start looking for that spark. And almost as though God's saying, can you see me? I'm here. Look harder, because I'm here, looking right back at you. And now this uh, is helpful for me when I'm in my neighborhood, when I'm driving in my car, when I watch the news, when I hear about uh, world events. I'm reminded that each and every person, without exception, bears the image of God. And this idea of being made in God's image is not something insignificant in how we view God or how we view each, view each other. 
But if I'm just getting to know someone, the only accurate opinion that I can have of them is that they have intrinsic value and are made in God's image. If you grab your Bible, again, um, turn to the first book in the New Testament. I love this story. Matthew chapter 22. Starting in verse 15. This is Jesus there teaching, and um, verse 15 says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said. This is such snake behavior, what they say next. We know you are a man of integrity, and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. I love it. It's, like a, it's, so, it's such a setup. You know it's a setup. They're buttering them up, right, before they stab him. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? I just imagine Jesus standing there like, I'm the, I'm the son of man. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, the personification of God here in the flesh. And you want to talk about taxes? Like, we're talking about taxes. That's what we're going to talk about right now. You want to ask me about taxes? Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay. um, But Jesus knew, verse 18, Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Okay. Show and tell time. I actually have uh, a Roman coin here um, with a picture of Caesar on it. Um, It's minted uh, 22, either 21 or 22 A.D., so, yeah, this is, the re- this is the real deal. It's my good friend Bruce uh, from our home church. He let it out of the bag. He was bragging about his coin collection. <laughs> and I knew that I was going to take that. I was like, hey, brother, how godly are you? Would you let me borrow this thing just for this, like, <laughs> special occasion? It was a beautiful test. And uh, Bruce, I won't give your last name just in case somebody's watching and they want to look you up and then pay you a visit later. Um, but, uh, but he lent this to me, and, um, and it's a beautiful reminder, this Caesar's head engraved on this coin. And Jesus says to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. And they were all amazed at him. And I love this story. I love this story because it shows Jesus transcending the question. Not politicking his way out of it, uh, not trying to answer it, but instead elevates the conversation to a level that stuns them in their tracks. It's like God is, is giving a rebuke. He says, you're so caught up in the things of this world, of laying traps, of gaining position, of securing the love and support of the people, you lose sight of the things that matter most. Let Caesar have whatever his face is on. But whatever has God's image belongs to God. And God wants us. He wants all of us. Every compartment that we make in our lives, our home, our work, our relationships, our church life, he wants to move every area of our life from unbelief to belief. He wants us to be consistent. And it's cool to have a a piece of something, this piece of bronze that's 2,000 years old. I don't know if I've ever held anything that old before in my hand. And during Jesus' day, it would only be worth probably a couple dollars. Today, it would be worth a little bit more than that. But the point actually remains the same. Uh, Jesus' point was that we are so much more valuable than this little coin. That even though that this coin is worth a little bit more today, it's not worthless, but it is considerably worth less than you and I. 
or anyone that's made in his image. Once we get this truth into us, it's a confirmation that um, while it's actually a helpful foundation that we can start forming our views on things like war and capital punishment and abortion and slavery and civil rights and the exploitation of all people everywhere if we start on that basis that everyone is made in the image of God. But we don't just want to look like God, we want to actually be like God. And that comes by facing him. And as we face God, we reflect all that goodness in the world. My friend shared with me recently a quote from Ruben Alves, a a theologian from South America. He says, see how we are lovely as the desire of God, so lovely that he created us to be mirrors, that his image and likeness should be reflected in us. And we made us, he made us from love, in love, for love, destined to walk with joined hands, sensitive to beauty and goodness to truth. Our body became animate, alive, at the breathing of the Spirit. Like a mirror or the moon, we face the source and reflect it. I want to bring us to uh, one of my favorite psalms, and that's Psalm 139. This is how we'll, we'll wrap things up today. And it starts here, I love, I love it. It starts with the first two verses. It says, oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. David is acknowledging without anything that God knows him, that God sees him. And with all of the bits that we try and hide and cover up and disguise, God is still there and leans in and is engaged with it. And he keeps going on. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. I rise on the wings of the dawn. If I settle on the far side, the the presence and the love of God is inescapable. And I love how it ends. All of that, God already knows. He knows everything about us, every bit. And I think we hate that. We hate to be seen, I think. We like to be noticed, but we don't want to be seen, if that makes sense. Because if we're seen, then people know us, and they might not really like what they see. But God sees all of it, and he loves it. He says, no, you're my kid. I see you. You got my, you resemble me in a way. And at the end of this passage, I love it. It starts off with God searching David and then ends with David just saying, Lord, search me. An invitation. God doesn't need an invitation. He knows already, but this is the kind of partnering that David does. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Partner with me, God. As you know my way, help me to see the things that need to be deconstructed or the things that mar or that that deface your image in me or that block it so that there can't be a, a clear and proper reflection of your goodness to the rest of the world. I want to close just with this prayer from uh, the conclusion of our, our Road to Hope for this week in Reflection. And that we would, um, yeah, let's, let's mean it when we pray it. Light of the world, you know all of me. You know what hides in the dark, and you know what the light exposes. You have called me to reflect your image, your light, to those around me. Help me to see me the way you see me. I don't want to hide in the dark. I want to live in the light. Speak your truth over my life and help me to see myself as you see me so that my life is a true reflection of of who you are. And all God's people say, amen. 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 Thank you. 
Quincy. Wow, I love that line that he said right at the end. He just kind of glossed over it. He said, we like to be noticed, but we hate to be seen. And just kind of seemed like, Quincy, you were thinking out loud. And to me, that just uh, struck me. And so I ask you this week, what does it look like to be seen? What does it look like to step into the light, even if it's scary, even if it feels like a risk? Well, one of those places where that can happen is home church. And if you are looking for a community, if you're looking for a place to process uh, the teaching or to process what's going on in life, home church is a great place to start. Really, really, it is. If you aren't yet a part of a home church, this week is the best week to start. You can see it there on your screen, themeetinghouse.com slash home church for all the information that you need, whether that's an in-person home church by a parish or an online home church um, from anywhere in the world. Okay, it has been so good to spend time together today. I hope you guys have a really blessed afternoon or day or week or wherever it is that you find yourself. Go in peace. We'll see you next time.